Okay. So I think it's time we actually had a discussion about the GNOME project. And uh, this is honestly a tough pill for me to swallow as a guy that is a big fan of the GNOME desktop environment. But it's a discussion we got to have nonetheless. And uh, honestly, th this is... I... Uh, it was tough for me to read this and... Uh, come to the realization that maybe GNOME is not the desktop environment that we should be pushing forward as uh, users of, of desktop Linux. And the reason I say this is because the developers don't care about us, the desktop users. And when you think about the people that develop GNOME and uh, look who who is help help funding the GNOME project itself you kind of grow to understand that. And the reason why I say this is because of all the desktop environments, I have to say that while GNOME has the best default settings in Linux, it's by far the most user unfriendly of the desktop environments. And that's because I personally think that that user preferences are the ultimate in user control over over app, over software applications. Ultimately, as users, we do have the choice to uh, remove or install the software. But if you read this known blog post that uh, I'm looking at right now, GNOME doesn't want you to modify the software. And that's honestly what how I'm start beginning to see it. And it's it's really tough for me to for me to say that. But uh there's a whole it's a blog post uh that's uh I'll have a link for in the description. It's uh written by Tobias Bernard. I think he's a GNOME developer, I'm not 100% certain. But, it's something we gotta talk about. And, uh, here, let me pull this over for you. He calls this the GNOME way. And, honestly, like, uh, reading over this post, I'm not certain I agree with the GNOME way anymore. He does bring up some very good points, though. And that's honestly what I want to talk about. He does link to uh, this other post here that was posted o over here uh, back in 2017. And honestly, I haven't really read that one or any of the other links yet. But coming to this one, I don't know if I agree. But uh, we got a couple things in here. We have a why, a what, the how, and uh, several other options. And we're just going to cover it. He believes that uh, software freedom as an inclusive, accountable model for producing technology in the commons. Well, that phrase is already wrong. Because uh, the Termite Project literally turned into abandonware because known developers were not wanting to be inclusive or even accountable. That is completely the opposite of what he just said right here. Our software is built to be usable by everyone except people that don't use the GNOME terminal. We care deeply about user experience, except we remove user preferences. Accessibility. Cool. Okay. Internationalization. I guess. And support for a diverse range of hardware, which the kernel does a better job than your desktop environment ever will, but that's a debate for another day. Software should be structurally and aesthetically elegant, both in terms of underlying technology 
and user interface, but we're using JavaScript in our desktop environment. I don't know if that's structurally or aesthetically elegant in the underlying technology. I mean, I guess it makes some things easier. I don't know. I'm not really that practiced of a developer to be able to really tell you if there's any benefit to JavaScript in, in GNOME. But uh, I would think that just GTK and C or C++ would be more than enough. And then we come to probably the most controversial opinions that he, sh that he posts here when it comes to the what, which is these are the things that we think are worth pursuing. And just as important, the kinds of things that should be avoided. So here's talking about third-party apps are the best abstraction to, the, to extend the core system with additional functionality. This is why we put a huge amount of work into empowering third-party app developers to build more and better apps. And I'm not going to lie, the GTK apps, the G, the, all the applications that use the GTK, GTK, they just look better than most QT apps, in my opinion. They really do. They they always look more uniform, especially if they're developed, especially if they're targeted at GNOME, because well. That's what they're talking about here, which I guess is really great. I do wish that the QT applications did look a little bit better out of the box. But at the same time, we're talking about QT, and you can modify just about anything in QT, unlike GTK these days. And then here he comes to something that I myself disagree with. Every preference has a cost. And this cost rises exponentially as you add more of them. This is technically speaking true. But it's the next sentence that really bugs me. This is why we avoid preferences as much as possible and fix on focusing the underlying problems instead. Okay. So, a preference is basically just an if-else statement. Let's let's just think of it that way. Just a toggle. If the, if the user wants this, let's do this. If not, this. Now, I understand that it gets a little bit more complicated than that. But a user should be able to modify the software using a GUI tool. Why is it that we have to that we have to use a command line to be able to be able to change our theme. There's a reason why the GNOME team still develops the GNOME Tweaks application. And that's because if they didn't, everybody would stop using GNOME. There are reasons why uh, GNOME extensions exist. But, and that's going to be a topic for later. Because he uh, talks about extensions as well. But. Oh, if by removing and avoiding preferences as much as possible. You are not fixing underlying problems. You're making them worse. Because. You're, you're go at this point you're assuming. That your one setting. Is fit for all. I'm not a UX designer. I'm not about to get into to the debate of user experience with you. But I can tell you that this website as it is, being plain white with black text on top, there's going to be somebody in the comments talking about how I'm blinding them right now. And I can tell you that there's going to be some people saying that, it sh that, that the site would look a lot better if it was dark with white text. I guarantee it. Might not be on these set. It might not be on the comments on my channel because, well, my channel's only got 75 subscribers right now. But it could be 
a lot less. And then the next point here comes, uh, similarly there is a direct relationship between how vertically integrated a product is and how cohesive you can make it. Yes and no. Even unnecessarily variable, you eliminate access, you, you, ugh. every unnecessary variable you eliminate across the stack frees up time and energy and creates opportunities for features you couldn't otherwise build. That is also true. Because uh, the GNOME team is a very inclusive team. They, for some reason, they just don't like third-party commits. They'll take third-party bug fixes, but when it comes to third-party features like uh, what the developer of Termite tried, they don't want it. They they'll just go like why why would the user of the gnome application want this? Stop assuming what the user wants. Stop assuming how the stop assuming how people use your software. Don't. Seriously, just don't assume that people are going to use the software in a certain way. And you will have a so much easier time dealing with people. I learned this developing a World of Warcraft user interface. I discovered this. People, people complain about everything. They really do. <laughs> but ultimately, they complain the most... When you don't let them do something, or you said, "Oh, I wasn't expecting," I, I have no plans for you using it that using this thing your, that way. So then uh, we come to uh, the how. We don't do hacks, rather than, rather than working around the problem at the layer abstraction. We believe in going at the root of the problem and fixing it for everyone. Cool, fix things. Don't remove them. Fix them. Uh, and he goes in talking about design. Okay. Uh, in practice, this is where the problems really start. App developers should do their own packing packaging. It's the only way to do it sustainably at scale. Yeah, that's true. And if that statement is true, is Flatpak really the future of app distribution? Honestly, Flatpak is not the future of app distribution. Sure, you can... Uh, not the way that's traditionally done, at least. In my personal opinion, if you're going to say that Flatpak is the future of app distribution, I'm going to argue that's actually AppImage. Why? Because AppImage works just like just like the Windows ecosystem. It's a, it's a, it's a file you can download, click on, and it runs. The only different, the only difference between Linux Windows is that you have to tell it that's executable, but that can be fixed. I'm serious, it can. Gnome can fix that. They choose not to. The traditional desktop is dead, and it's not coming back. Gnome hasn't been a traditional desktop for a while. So I don't even see why he has to make that statement. And even then, what is wrong with the traditional desktop themes? What is wrong with a menu bar and a status icon? They have, those two things have worked for people for years. And honestly, I prefer status icons. Why? Because if I have a system tray and I have things running in that tray, it's because I want that tray to display that information to me. Like, uh, say, when I get a notification on Discord, I want, I want to be able to see that. Or, like, I get an email, I want to be able to see that in my system tray. I don't want it coming from my notifications menu. I want it sitting there in my tray, presented to me constantly. 
of course, right now I'm using a window manager that doesn't even have a have a system tray, <laughs> which is interesting. System wide theming is a broken idea. If you don't like the way that apps look, contribute to them di directly. Why even bother using GTK then? Why don't you just write your own tool toolkit, GNOME? Why do you keep using GIMPs? It's not that system-wide theming is a terrible idea. It's just an idea that you don't agree with. That's, that's really what it is. Shell extensions are always going to be a niche thing. If you want to have a real impact, your time is better invested working on apps or GNOME shell itself. Again, like I stated earlier, the GNOME team does not like it when you add a new feature to their de to their desktop environment, so don't even try. It's easier just to write the extension. It really is. And if you think the extensions are a niche thing, Tell that to the distribution, the distributions that package your GNOME desktop environment and ship it. Because Fedora ships with extensions enabled. And Fedora is the distribution that is based off of Red Hat that also ships with extensions enabled. That you guys make more than half of your money from. The only distributions that, that ship known without any extensions are Debian and Arch. That's all that I know of. So why is it that extensions are a broken idea? Why don't you just embrace the extensions by giving by having and maintaining a, a base, base API for extensions. You don't have to really support it post that. Just make an API available for like putting stuff in the top, in the top bar. Actively develop the extension manager yourselves. Uh, filling the available space is rarely a goal by itself. An easy way to design yourself into a corner. Okay. I use an ultra-wide monitor. Why do I use an ultra-wide monitor? Because I didn't have enough space on, on a traditional monitor. I, I use GNOME on, on it. And uh, GNOME 3 and GNOME 40 aren't the best for it. I'm, I'm just going to say that now. But even then, the the way that you use GNOME, in general, at least the way that I used GNOME was, I always used GNOME in full screen. 100% of the screen being used. All the time. Which means that I filled all the available space. All the time. It's not that I set it as a goal. But because that's how I found the the desktop to work best. It's this statement that drives me crazy the most. Why can't I fill the available space? What is wrong? What is actually wrong with it? And why are you saying that I'm designing myself into a corner? I don't understand. Seriously. Explain that to me, please. <laughs> but you're probably not going to, so don't worry about it. You see, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. For like the past year or so, well, not even the past year. The past, well, maybe it's been a year. No, I'd say about half of a year I've been using just the standard tiling window manager and that was a DWM why do I use DWM because uh, I'm an 
I'm an advocate for the user experience. And honestly, if you install DWM and you look at it, you you might understand what I'm talking about here. But when I'm talking about user experience, I'm talking about the ultimate inflexibility. And while I understand that DWM is not the window manager that uh, is not the most flexible in the world because, well, it's pretty bare bones. I find that's the most flexible for me. I'll be posting more videos on window window managers in a, in a little while, but uh, when I'm talking about the uh, flex flexibility, I'm I'm not talking about keybinds. I have discussed keybinds before, but when I'm talking about flexibility, I'll. I'm talking about making the software work the way that I personally want it to. When I open a window, I want to I want it to open in one place at one spot every single time. And while I know I can do it in KDE, I can never get that to do reliably in GNOME. And uh, I just got off of a three-ish week stint on KDE Plasma. And honestly, the only reason I'm back on a tiling window manager is because, well, I found it kind of preferable after a while. So, don't tell me that you want to take away the flexibility of your software. Just don't. Because I don't want you to make make me use the software you want me to. That is all. Got some opinions on it? Go ahead and share them in the comments. Don't be afraid to subscribe, maybe. If anything, you'll just get more videos like this in my weekly D&D campaign. If anything, uh, your comments might even inspired me to talk about something else. See ya.